the, the Renaissance is really a new field for us, and we have just started uh, to look into the documents. Of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem of quantity, because there were so many more people involved. You know, and it's for historians, it's a must not just to look at the published written records, but we also, you know, for Einstein, in Einstein's case, we carefully looked for years at his notebooks, which fortunately are preserved and tell the story of the search for general relativity in great detail. And, you know, if you really want to understand that story, you have to study the notebooks uh, and you have to study the correspondence, because even though it seems that Einstein did it all by himself, the great contrast to quantum theory, you know, he did have a lot of collaborators, some well-known collaborators, competitors, people like Nordström or, or, or Hilbert. I'm going to say a little bit about them later. But then he had also the friends, the, the, a group of friends like Michele Besso, Marcel Grossmann and others who helped him along uh, the way. Uh, they didn't necessarily, with the exception of Grossmann, becoming authors of his publications. But if you want to understand, you know, how he thought and how he you know, develop creatively his ideas, you have to take into account that informal network of communication. So now scale this up to the size of an exploding scientific community. And one of the talks, you know, this is, by the way, a joint talk with uh, Roberto Lalli and Alex Bloom. I'm mentioning Roberto and, uh, and Alex uh, also because they yesterday gave talks that in a more detailed uh, fashion uh, specified the two aspects that I'm trying to bring together today namely the sociological side of, of the story and the content, the ideas, history of ideas side. I'll try this in the meantime. Well, improvisation is very good. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, Roberto showed us yesterday a curve, and I don't think it, uh, I have it in our common talk, about you know, the steep rise of the PhD population in the, in the late 50s and early 60s. And many of them really contributed creatively to the theory. Yes? Uh, you are being recorded, so proceed. So, so I, I, I jump over the improvisation part. <laughs> 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 okay. okay. So you bear, bear with me. I think, you know, it is, it is a concentrated text. So bear with me. And if you, you know, feel you should interrupt me, please do so. But I will now go through the text. Otherwise, I'm not sure that I can cover all the material in, in a reasonable time. So the history of general relativity is one of the great success stories of 20th century physics. And it would be easy to give an entire lengthy talk uh, just on the major discoveries and breakthroughs, and in particular also on the outstanding physicists who made these breakthroughs. And uh, I can refer you for really great reviews if you want to follow that up. It's on the, on the archive, on the Los Alamos archive. Uh, by uh, Abe Ashtika. He wrote one uh, on his own and one with collaborators. And that is, these are really great overviews if you want to just get, get an, a quick overview of, of, of the field. But what I want to convince you, or we want to convince you of today, is that this also, the history, the recent history of general relativity provides an inter interesting subject for the history of science. And uh, as I said already, th that history is still terra incognita, incognita as far as really the source-based investigation is concerned. There are, however, some magnificent pioneering study. And uh, Dan Kenefick, who is sitting here, wrote one of these pioneering studies on the history of gravitational wave research. And that shows you how many interesting you know, uh, things happened and how sociological developments, intellectual developments intertwine. So it's really uh, a, a new field, also methodologically speaking, in a way. And there are, and many of you may know them, uh, the series of the Einstein Studies volumes edited by John Stachel and Don Howard, and many case studies, in particular also case studies by participants, are reported in, in those volumes. And uh, as I said, um, it's a methodological challenge to bring the intellectual development uh, together with uh, development of context, I mean, technical developments played a role, instrumentation played a role, funding played a role, new forms of organization, but also the context of the uh, first the war and then the Cold War, uh, without which you cannot understand that history. Uh, we have assembled, this is larger than an individual work, by the way, that's, you know, in, in physics you are all used to that. In the history it's much less common. People have to write in order to make their careers their own monographies and then, you know, it, it's almost a hallmark of the field, I have to say, that you separate yourself from everybody else by writing an outstanding book. But it's much more useful, in my view, 
if you also do collaboration, and such a field can only be addressed if you do collaboration. So for this reason, we have uh, you know, assembled a group of, of uh, historians that collaborate on these issues. And for us still, even in this recent history, it's an important uh, thing to collaborate with the Einstein Papers Project at Caltech. It's great to have uh, Diana Buckwald here with us, who has been supportive of all of these enterprises for many years and just has realized a wonderful digital uh, edition together with uh, Princeton University uh, Press of Einstein's paper. So if you, I, can only hard, I can only warmly recommend that to you. But, but rather than summarizing what we are doing or what we have done so far, I want to illustrate you some, ki some questions that uh, hopefully convince you that the history of science has its own intellectual agenda and that it might even be uh, helpful in producing some insights that you know, may stimulate at least the future discussions that, that David was mentioning. So uh, to start with questions, so we have come up with three questions. You know, we don't know, but you know, we hope that this will be the three classical questions of the history of general relativity. So first, the problem of the stability of general relativity and its curious relation to empirical knowledge. Why did general relativity survive the last century essentially unchanged? In particular, how could Einstein, on the basis of just one minor deviation from Newton's theory, the perihelion shift of Mercury, formulate a theory that has since not only withstood all attempts at modification, but also served as the basis for the explanation of cosmological and astrophysical phenomena that were entirely unimaginable at the time of the theory's creation? How could it be that phenomena that are today at the forefront of empirical research in general relativity such as the expanding universe, black holes, or gravitational lensing, was somehow contained in a, uh, in a theory formulated in 1915, although none of these phenomena were known or even imagined at the time. Given its scant empirical uh, foundation, there was initially little hope that general relativity would prove to be as universal a theory uh, as it turned out to be. Instead, in the early years, people expected it to meet with successive theories at all kinds of boundaries. This is in stark contrast, and I mean the real situation comes only out if you compare it to another situation, namely that of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics had been prepared by more than half a century of new experimental findings from atomic spectra via dispersion phenomena, low temperature physics, the discovery of radioactivity and new forms of radiation, to experiments with black body radiation, all of this preceding the formulation of quantum mechanics. And immediately after the establishment of, of quantum mechanics, it provided a wealth of explanations of hitherto unexplainable phenomena such as chemical binding or the stability of matter, while general relativity at first remained rather stale. Second, we want to examine the related problem of the stability of the concepts of space and time and the virtually exclusive role of general relativity in shaping these concepts. Why is general relativity, among all the physical theories that have emerged in the 20th century, the only one that so far, so far, has successfully changed our concepts of space and time? Indeed, the relativity revolution set an example of constructing a new physical theory by modifying notions of space and time. And that turned out to be a very effective, a very attractive example set by the theory. You can see it, for instance, when you study the early uh, struggle for quantum mechanics, when people like Heisenberg believed that maybe also quantum mechanics, with its abandonment of the Bohr orbits and later with phenomena such entanglement, would lead to new concepts of space and time. Intending to mimic uh, the, uh, to in, uh, I'm sorry, intending to mimic Einstein's alleged path to, to relativity, many physicists adopted the method of what was called geometrization in the sense of using generalized notion of geometry as a new approach to doing physics. To this day, the status of this approach remains controversial. Was geometrization actually what Einstein had used to elegantly solve the problem of a relativistic field theory of gravitation uh, by the way, it turned out that this topic was uh, one of the topics hotly discussed in our own conference, in particular after the presentation of Dennis Lehmkohl. Dennis is here? There he is, yeah. So in the discussion, you know, we can talk about it. 
Or was it instead of geometrization, rather what uh, Peter Bergman had called a physicalization of geometry? And is it indeed a royal road to doing physics? In any case, no other theory did have a similarly profound and lasting impact on our notions of space and time. And just as it was the case for our first problem, the stability and universality of general relativity, this, this lasting effect on space and time could have hardly been clear at the outset. So, you know, as historians, we always, you know, wary of uh, what, what is called weak history of teleological prediction that take it for granted what is today uh, evident. So we want to really understand why and how this came about. And indeed, whether the physicalization of geometry was just a heuristic trick or a profound insight, physicists in 1915 were left with the task of integrating, and that means potentially also modifying, general relativity into the rest of physics, guided either by the vision of a unified field theory or by that of creating a quantum theory, including gravitation. So why is it that general relativity changed our notions of space and time in such a unique and persistent way. Third, and that will be the main subject, I will address the issue of the Renaissance, referring to the period in the late 50s and early 60s when general relativity became an internationally visible, highly active field of research in which theoretical explorations went hand in hand with new astrophysical discoveries, such as those of the quasars or the cosmic microwave background. Why did the field need such a renaissance at all? With the 1919 confirmation, with the 1919 confirmation uh, of the gravitational light bending during a solar eclipse, the theory had experienced a spectacular astronomical success that was 10 years later followed by Hubble's observation of the redshift of distant galaxies, confirming the expanding universe solutions that had earlier been proposed by Friedman and Lemaitre. Nevertheless, the theory did experience what the historian of science Jean Eisenstadt has aptly called a low watermark uh, period, in which it attracted the attention of relatively few scientists, at least compared to other fields of physics, and in which it was often uh, considered as merely providing some minor corrections to Newton's theory of gravitation. The systematic exploration of exact solutions, the understanding of space-time singularities, or of the physical reality of gravitational waves, all came only after the low watermark period and in the wake of the renaissance of general relativity. By the way, as you didn't participate in our other conference, I think the term, Rob, Roberto, tell me if I'm right, was coined by Clifford Will, yeah. who wrote uh, a nice uh, little article on that. And, uh, you know, among the historians' community, it's, of course, widely debated what really caused uh, the... Uh, what caused the, uh, the, uh, the Renaissance. There are some obvious reasons that come immediately to mind, such as the enhanced and increased role of theoretical physics, uh, first in the war and then uh, after the war in the Cold War period. Uh, you know, physics gained in societal recognition, uh, in, 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 in so societal context broadly speaking, but also in, in specifically in military uh, context. And last night we had an interesting conversation with, with David who said that even the military understood that one needed to give some leeway to the theoretical physicists who had built the bombs. So, you know, there were created creative niches emerging, you know, uh, and, and, and when Alex Blum and myself, you know, went to the 50th anniversary last year of the Texas Symposium, you know, moderating a round table without snow. Well, there was snow <laughs> even in Texas, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we, we, you know, imagine different scenarios to make it clear what the issues debated were among the historians. And so this, this idea that uh, it was mainly the funding issue, you know, was dubbed by us the sugar daddy scenario, right? And it, 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 it was contrasted with other scenarios. Uh, you know, Engelberg Schucking recounted in his own memories the emergence of the Texas Symposium as coming out from a conversation at a pool in Texas, you know, under the boredom, in the boredom of Texas, uh, and, and that was called the three men at a pool scenario. <laughs> and, and then we came up, and you will hear more about it in the following, with the sleeping beauty scenario, general relativity as the sleeping beauty. Uh, 
So, but I mean, there is a serious problem here uh, because you, you, you clearly there's everything is happening at the same time as always in history. You know, there's big funding coming in or relatively big funding coming in. There are new astronomical, astrophysical discoveries coming in. There are new theoretical developments taking place. But how does it really hang together? And if you look closely, what is amazing is that the community was so quickly able to react to the new astrophysical discoveries, the discovery of quasars, and then immediately you had things like the Kerr solution and proposing reasonable you know, physical scenarios for this. Why was the community, after this long watermark period, capable of doing that? So, uh, but we, I will get, get back there, but it would take some time because you know, I will give, go back now to the early history for some time. So let me begin uh, our attempt to give preliminary answers to these questions by a short review of the genesis of general relativity that was subject, uh, of a major, the subject of a major research project in 2007. And I'm partly substituting here, as a matter of fact, for Leo Corey, who was closely involved with this project and who couldn't come, come here. And there are other members of this uh, research project that uh, are here, Tillmann Sauer, sitting in the back, was uh, heavily involved with this. And so we worked for many years together on this, on a relatively small episode comparing to what I'm covering uh, uh, today. Uh, but the main purpose of the review I'm giving here of this period is to introduce some key notions that might help us to address the problems I have just mentioned, namely the stability problem, the geometry problem, and the problem of the Renaissance. Einstein's first revolution, as it is often referred to, is represented by the papers of his miraculous year 1905. <coughs> they have provided explanations of the electrodynamics of moving bodies, of black body radiation, of the photoelectric effect and of Brownian motion and, and some other things. These seemingly unrelated breakthroughs have actually more than one hidden connection among each other. For our purposes, the most significant communality is that they all are dealing with borderline problems of classical physics. These are problems that can be independently characterized in terms of empirical knowledge, but which fall into the domain of at least two different conceptual frameworks, such as electrodynamics and mechanics, in the case of the electrodynamics of moving bodies. Because they belong to the domain of distinct conceptual frameworks, they may reveal fundamental tensions or even contradictions between these frameworks, such as the conflict between the relativity principle of mechanics and the principle of the constancy of the speed of light characteristic of electrodynamics. General relativity also emerged from such a borderline problem, in this case between Newton's theory of gravitation and special relativity. The concrete problem in which this conflict manifested itself was that of free fall in a gravitational field, conceptualized by Einstein in the year 1907 in terms of the equivalence principle. It helped him bringing together Galileo's principle of the universality of free fall and the treatment of accelerated motion according to special relativity. As it is typical for borderline problems revealing conceptual conflicts between two domains of knowledge, they give rise to the proliferation of a variety of plausible responses to them. So that typically happens. It's a bit what Kuhn calls the crisis situation. When you r run into such a situation, then people come up with all kinds of uh, uh, proposals. In contrast to some of his contemporaries, actually to most of his contemporaries, if not all of his contemporaries, one has to you know, be careful here, Einstein decided to stick to Galileo's principle of the universality of free fall and take its implications seriously enough to begin changing once more the new concepts of space and time he had established himself just two years ago with creating special relativity. Another borderline problem was that of black body radiation, related both to electromagnetism and thermodynamics. It became a starting point for the quantum revolution. In contrast to the borderline problems marked by the electrodynamics of moving bodies and the equivalence principle, it did not lead to a revision of the concepts of space and time. <coughs> Why? Answering this question is relevant to our second issue, that of the role of physicalization of geometry as an approach to fundamental problems in physics. The borderline problem of the electrodynamics of moving bodies, as it was embodied in concrete physical experiments, such as the Fizeau experiment, the Michelson-Morley experiment, the Charlton-Noble experiment, and, and many others, 
involved a clash between two pre-existing fundamental space-time structures. One was the framework of classical mechanics, of course, comprising inertial frames and the relativity principle. The other was the framework of classical electrodynamics, comprising the ether, as it was then called, and the constancy of the speed of light with regard to the ether frame. Of course, it was not immediately apparent that the latter framework was effectively a space-time framework, since the ether was actually considered as a physical medium carrying electromagnetic waves. It turned out, however, that it was impossible to conceive of a physical medium with all the properties that were required for the ether. It was Einstein's great insight that these properties could be more convincingly conceptualized on another level of knowledge, not that of the material content of physics, but on that of its space-time framework. This was only possible, however, because first of the universal character of the properties ascribed to the ether, and second, because, of the, uh, because the classical notions, the familiar notions of space and time, turned out to be flexible enough to allow for this modification without completely losing their intuitive meaning. And if you read Einstein's 1905 paper, you see that he glues together specific technical insights from electrodynamics with some basic operational understanding of space-time measurements. You can really see the two layers of knowledge coming together there. The same holds true for the borderline problem triggering the genesis of general relativity. From the perspective of classical physics, it was the clash between a particular field theory and the new space-time framework of special relativity imposing conditions on such a field theory, such as the requirement that no physical effect propagate faster than light. This was also the view of most of Einstein's contemporaries, so the problem was shared. The different perspective that Einstein took on this problem was highly influenced by his reading of Ernst Mach's critique of classical mechanics. Mach had pointed to the possibility that the inertial forces occurring in an accelerated frame may be interpreted as forces between distant masses and hence be comparable to gravitational forces in their nature. Yet, something's happening? No, nothing. Nothing exciting is happening. <laughs> Yet, I've been, in, I have been enlarged here. <laughs> He had thus, uh, Mach, in this critique, which was you know, a philosophically informed uh, critique of classical mechanics, he had thus opened up a perspective that made it possible to conceive of gravitation and inertia as two aspects of the same interaction, even if he did so in a rather roundabout way. Einstein, coming from, you know, reading Mach, but coming from a different perspective, was reminded of electric and magnetic fields being two aspects of the same interaction manifesting itself differently in dependence on the frame of reference chosen. This suggested to him a theory of the gravito-inertial field built on the model of the electromagnetic field but incorporating now a generalized principle of relativity. Five years after these initial insights in 1912, he realized that such a theory would have to be built on the metric tensor. What he thus achieved in hindsight was a reconciliation of the metric space-time structure of special relativity with the equally universal but not yet recognized affine structure representing gravitation and inertia in classical mechanics. Newton had interpreted gravitation as a force. His 19th century followers, including Einstein, as a field. Only in the roundabout way whose beginning I have just sketched it became gradually clear that what general relati relativity first of all achieved, or first of all resolved, was a clash between two equally universal structures of space-time manifested in the borderline problem of free fall described by the equivalence principle. As John Stachel has pointed out, the awkwardness of this pathway was mainly due to the lack of the appropriate mathematical tools to capture one of these structures the understanding of gravitation and inertia in, ter in terms of a projective or affine structure, which was only after 1915 elaborated in the work of Levi-Civita, Weil, and Cartan. <laughs>
Even in this early phase of the history of general relativity, we thus find preliminary answers to both our stability question and the question of the physicalization of geometry. General relativity became a theory of space-time, not because of Einstein's predilection for a geometrization of physics, a notion that he always strongly rejected, but because the physicalization of geometry emerged from a clash between two pre-existing universal space-time structures, which each captured a wealth of physical experiences. The projective or affine structures underlying classical mechanics and the light cone or metric structures underlying classical optics and electrodynamics. The wealth of physical experiences condensed in these structures was, of course, not lost in the transition from classical physics to general relativity, but just transformed into a more encompassing and coherent overall structure. It is this conservative nature of general relativity with respect to the knowledge accumulated over centuries in classical physics and even earlier that accounts to a great extent for its impressive stability and resilience. And you know, in the traditional accounts of scientific revolution, you know, this kind of continuity is often overlooked because we are really addressing here two issues at the same time, namely the complete conceptual novelty of general relativity on the one hand, and yet its capability of preserving all that knowledge that had been accumulated in the past. But adequately representing and integrating this accumulated knowledge within a coherent mathematical theory was by no means a trivial task. Even after Einstein had identified the metric tensor as, a repre as the representation of the gravitational potential of his new theory in 1912. So that was a momentous step, but it was by far not uh, uh, the whole story. When following his further pathway to the field equations of general relativity, we observe a fundamental dynamics of theory development, characteristic in some sense also for the later history, but on a larger scale. And we will further find clues to answering our three questions. And I find it remarkable that, uh, and I've mentioned it already, that electrodynamics served as a model for building up the relativistic field theory of gravitation, because that was the most elaborate theory or field theory that was around, so it served for Einstein as a model. And that happened also, of course, later. Later attempts to quantize general relativity, quantum electrodynamics served as a similarly model uh, structure. But the difference was, of course, that when the, at the time that Einstein started to work on general relativity, electrodynamics was a mature, fully developed theory, whereas quantum electrodynamics was not when the first attempts at quantizing gravity were done in, in the 30s. I will come back to this point later. Between 1912 and 1915, Einstein followed a double strategy in his search for the gravitational field equation. He started, on the one hand, from physically plausible assumptions, such as the Newtonian limit, and and then he tried to cautiously generalize these assumptions. This was his physical strategy. He explored, on the other hand, advanced mathematical tools such as the Riemann tensor, trying to extract physically meaningful expression from them, satisfying certain physical criteria, the Newton Newtonian limit, energy momentum conservation, and, and so on. This was his mathematical strategy. At first, these strategies seemed to point in different directions. The mathematical strategy delivered him candidates he was unable, at least at first, he was unable to reconcile with his physical criteria, and most famously, the Newtonian limit. How is the Newtonian limit achieved in general relativity? Einstein didn't know, of course. He had certain expectations, but that ex those expectations didn't uh, reconcile with you know, the candidates that he extracted from the Riemann tensor. The physical strategy, on the other hand, eventually led him in 1913 to an acceptable theory which fell, however, far behind his original ambitions, in particular with regard to a generalized principle of relativity. And this was the so-called Entwurf or Draft Theory of 1913, published together with Grossman. But, and this theory is often just, uh, you know, uh, 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 considered to be a staircase wit of the history and a wrong theory, but it had a very important function. And I mean, this is a lesson we really can take home. Uh, from, from this story. This was a wrong theory in hindsight, but it did play a very fundamental and important reason because it allowed Einstein in a relativistic uh, framework to elaborate the physical conse consequences of a theory of the gravitational field, in particular uh, uh, a calculation, a detailed 
if unsuccessful calculation of the perihelion shift of Mercury. You know, there's the famous story that when Einstein in uh, late 1915, you know, came, came up with a new candidate for his, his theory, that within a week he could calculate the perihelion shift and Hilbert was suppressed. He wrote him a postcard saying, and Leo would have told that in, in glorious detail, details here, were he here, that he said, if I could calculate as quickly as you can, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the hydrogen uh, atom would give his excuse uh, uh, for not radiating. In, and, and, and so he was quite impressed. But the trick was, of course, that Einstein, by the way, together with a collaborator, Michele Besso, had done the detailed calculations uh, already in, uh, in 1913. And uh, this was elaborated in great detail by Michel Janssen, who uh, worked on this manuscript in the context of the Einstein uh, papers. Uh, so, as it turned out, the elaboration of this preliminary mathematical framework constituted an important learning experience that gradually also shifted Einstein's physical understanding of the problems at hand, and in particular also of the role of the Newtonian limit in this theory. Einstein learned how to do the Newtonian limit only in this very last moment in uh, November uh, 1915, after he had done the perihelion uh, calculation. Eventually, the elaborated and Wolf theory became capable of acting, and I'm using here a notion that uh, Michel Janssen has introduced, as a scaffolding for reconciling physical and mathematical strategies and for constructing full general relativity. All of this happened, and you know, these are the footnotes that I won't detail here, all of this happened on the background of exploring not just general relativity, but also alternative theories of gravitation, in particular Nordstrom's special relativistic theory of gravitation, in whose development Einstein himself played an important role. And that's an interesting collaborating with, with Nordstrom. I think it's also a lesson to take home from this, that you shouldn't just focus on your own theories, but occasionally help your competitor to see what, what this all leads to. And Nordstrom's theory was a theory, of course, that led to less radical implications for space and time than general relativity. And the failure of Nordstrom's theory was, of course, a big element in what I have called the stability of the space-time notions established by general relativity. And the other story is it happened on the background of Einstein's tireless efforts to convince astronomers to provide him with evidence for his new theory. Really tireless efforts, you know, with success, but, you know, at, at you know, at a great cost in a, in, in a way, you know, many, many attempts. And that's a long story that uh, stretches well into the Renaissance period, the difficult collaborations between physicists and, and astronomers. So there are many features in this rather unique history that nevertheless mark also the later development of general relativity. First of all, for a long time to come, as I said, I just said it, the collaboration with the astronomers. Uh, second, uh, Second, the complementarity of physical and mathematical strategies remain relevant. So what you see in Einstein's you know, collaboration with Grossman on a very small scale and later with, with Hilbert, if we have time in the discussion, I can tell you a little bit more about the Hilbert story. I will not now because that would fall a bit out of my framework. It would have been the main uh, subject of, of Leo's talk, but you can see here the different perspectives coming from different disciplinary traditions of physicists and mathematicians. And you know, if you follow that development over a longer period of time, what you can see there's kind of, an, I, I called it once an equilibration process going, going on, where, you know, in the case of Hilbert, for instance, he's learning more and more about uh, the physical meaning of the expressions that he had so elegantly derived. Einstein becoming more and more sophisticated in terms of the mathematics. And so even if not, you know, at a given moment, but in the longer term, there is a kind of you know, convergence or almost convergence, at least a better, better understanding. And, and this interaction between elaboration of mathematical formalism and the need to physically interpret them is, of course, an ongoing uh, process. Third, and I've mentioned that already, uh, the ongoing interaction of general relativity with other field theories, in particular with electrodynamics. So in that sense, uh, the pursuit of general relativity was never quite totally isolated from other fields uh, of, of, of physics. Fourth, general relativity continued to meet with competitor theories. Again, uh, that's a, uh, an issue that came, uh, you know, and that's also, I consider this a bit of convergence, Dennis, that uh, Dennis gave us a lecture on Brown Sticker theory, Jordan's theory. So, you know, you know, that's of course a little bit later, but, uh, you know, all of the time we, we meet competitor theories. Its stability must therefore also be conceived as resulting from the exploration and demise of these competitor theories. Fifth, as Jaron van Dongen, who is also here, where's Jaron? 
yeah, so that you know our players here, uh, has, has stressed uh, Einstein's interpretation, reinterpretation, one might say, of his own success as the exclusive triumph of a mathematical strategy. That's also what happens to many scientists when they look back at their own successes. They see the solution of the puzzle and they can hardly imagine anymore how confused the puzzle wa was before they solved it. So when Einstein had the field equations, you know, it seemed so natural to take the Riemann tensor, to extract the Ricci tensor from it, that he thought he could do this just you know, <coughs> without the scaffolding. I have just mentioned the Entwurf theory as a scaffolding. So just by an elegant royal mathematical road. And of course, I think the competition with Hilbert played a role also there. And then later in his life, he himself and many others emulating his example, or his alleged example, tried to mimic that mathematical strategy. Six, and that is, I think, a more profound epistemological issue. In the further development, at least until the time of the Renaissance, let me be careful here, no other borderline problem was encountered in which space-time structures of universal significance were in came into conflict and no other revision of space-time of the space-time structure of general relativity was hence necessitated on empirical grounds. How that plays out in the later history of quantum gravity, I will come back in the, in the later uh, part of the talk. In the light of these general remarks, and here I'm basically finished with my rehash of the early history, and I thank you for your patience of listening to that. In the light of these general remarks, let us now turn to the aftermath of Einstein's creation of general relativity. We shall first consider some theoretical developments, including early attempts at quantizing Einstein's theory, in order then to turn to cosmology and astrophysics. So let me start with the theoretical developments. And from the beginning, I have to say, general relativity seemed to point beyond itself, encouraging attempts, for various reasons that I have indicated, to modify it or to embed it in larger theoretical frameworks. When in 1963, at a Lesuch meeting, Sinch looked back at what he considered, and that's a confirmation of Eisenstadt's view of the low watermark period, or what he considered to be the scarce achievements of the early period, he pointed to this tendency of modifying general relativity as one of the reasons for these scarce achievements. I'm reading the quote. In those 50 years, the progress that has been made is less than one might expect. And then he gives various reasons, and he says, another reason is perhaps to be found in the scientific unrest of the 20th century, Old theories have been broken up, and the infection of this destructive zeal has incited many to try to modify the new theories. Einstein himself devoted many years to the modification of his 1916 theory. Indeed, as we have discussed, Einstein's success set an appealing example for pursuing a purely mathematical strategy, and in particular to employ generalized, no generalized notions of geometry as an approach to fundamental problems of physics. A first prominent example is Weyl's 1918 attempt to unify gravitation and electromagnetism by introducing a new space-time geometry in which not only the direction but also the length of a vector changes in parallel transport. But as Einstein objected, in this theory, the frequency of the spectral lines would depend on the location and past history of atoms for which there was no evidence. This proposal thus did not emerge from an empirically motivated borderline problem suggesting a revision of space-time structure, but just introduced a new mathematical option in an attempt at formal unification of the gravitational and the electromagnetic field. The same holds true for Kaluza's 1921 proposal to introduce a fifth space-like dimension. It achieved the formal unification of gravitational and electromagnetism while arbitrarily restricting the dynamics of space-time in the fifth dimension through a cylinder condition. While these attempts at generalizing the notion of geometry adopted Einstein's methodology of constructing a theory as a theory of space-time, they did not bring any new insights into the structure of space-time itself to the table, at least none that were in any way related to actual space-time experiences. With the advent of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, Unified field theories, such as those early examples that I have just uh, the time to, to quote, receded into the background, and they definitely represented a declining research program at the time of the renaissance of general relativity. 
Nevertheless, these attempts established important new theoretical tools that were to be reused and further developed in the subsequent history. And I emphasize this point. These were not just failures and check off and then you go on. But of course, these uh, uh, act like uh, you know, cumulative potentials that you can later go back to. And I think also that's why the history of science can help in reminding us of some of these potential. So in particular, some of these early ideas played a role in the modern gauge theory of Yang Mills fields and their employment for unifying electromagnetic and weak nuclear forces and later for formulating the standard model. These theories use the mathematics of gauge natural fiber bundles, while the standard formulation of general relativity only requires natural fi fiber bundles. Uh, remarkably, however, after the renaissance of general relativity, the language used to describe these structures shifted somewhat from that of field theory to that of geometry. In any case, and this is an important point for understanding the renaissance, uh, the run-up to the renaissance, much of the expertise and the motivation for exploring Einstein's theory was, during its low watermark period in the 30s, 40s, and early 50s, also stored in these traditions of unified field theory, following Einstein's own example of going beyond general relativity, often interpreted as a geometrization of physics rather than as a physicalization of geometry. So one way of going beyond general relativity that was suggested by the model of electromagnetism was to quantize it as a relativistic field theory. In the decades uh, following the construction of the first quantum field theories in the late 1920s, immediately after the birth of quantum mechanics, a fair amount of formal progress was made in the quantization of general relativity. And by the way, and Alex Bloom gave a wonderful talk yesterday on this, this, uh, this story of the, uh, the history of quantum field theory started incredibly early. It basically started at the time some of the main actors were still involved with uh, with quantum mechanics proper and already people like Jordan in particular thought very early on of quantum field theories and the, and the quantization of gravitation as well played early on a very important role but a different role than it did play in later periods and that's part of the story uh, I'm briefly uh, sketching here. So I said a, a, a fair amount of formal progress was achieved and let me just give three examples for that. Linearized uh, GR had been fully quanti quantized by Bronstein in 1936 and updated to the covariant renormalized framework by DeWitt in 1950. Techniques had been developed for dealing with the constraints imposed by the general covariance of the full theory with pioneering work by Rosenfeld in 1930 and Don Salisbury is among us who has you know, done a great deal in uh, re uh, recalling uh, the important role that Rosenfeld played as a forgotten uh, pioneer and yesterday in, in some historical reviews we we noted that you know many things. I mean, there's a famous meta theorem of James Stafford that I should quote at this point that everything worth discovering general relativity was at least discovered twice, and of course the name is very often attached then to the second discovery, and and so it's it's worth uh, reminding uh, of the role of Rosenfeld in the 1930s, but then it was followed by the development of an elaborate framework of constrained Hamiltonian dynamics by Birac, by Dirac and Bergman beginning in the late 1940s. Spin one half particles had been integrated into the theory by Weil and Fock in 1929 using the tetrad formulation of GRF, originally developed by Einstein for his unified field theory of teleparallelism. Still, by the time of the Renaissance, this was all there was. There was no theory of quantum gravity to replace GR, such as QED replaced electrodynamics, looking quite different from the classical theory. Quantum gravity offered no empirical predictions. The sole physical quantity that had been calculated was photon gravity scattering by Rosenfeld in 1930, an absurdly unmeasurable quantity. Most importantly for us, the attempts at applying formal quantization techniques to GR had provided no insights into how the resulting theory would modify the picture of space-time offered by classical GR. Indeed, a new view of space-time was not the goal of the quantum gravity work done at the time. Basically, uh, basically, this statement holds true until the 1970s, when new ways of conceiving space and time were introduced, first by Roger Penrose and later by others, and when string theory, originally conceived in the context of the strong nuclear interaction, established a connection with gravitation. 
Instead, in the 1950s, the hope was that the quantization of a theory like GR, a classical field theory with very unique properties, would deliver a better quantum field theory than the renormalized QED and the problematic nuclear field theories of the day. The special property of GR that was the focal point of many such expectations was not, as we see from today very often, background independence, but the determination of the equation of motion for matter through the vacuum field equations alone, as laid out by Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffmann in, the 1930, in 1938. And for the history, one can, uh, cannot overestimate the significance of the Einstein, Infeld, Hoffmann procedure in stimulating ideas and, and technical process, both in GR and uh, in, in these uh, attempts at quantization. Just like the vacuum field equations of GR defined the equation of motion of point-like particles through the einstein infeld hoffmann procedure, it was hoped that a quantum theory of gravity would similarly give the quantum mechanics or even the quantum field theory of matter for free. Wheeler's invention of geons seems the clearest attempt at bringing the geometrical insights of GR to bear on outstanding problems in quantum field theory by both eliminating particle singularities and obtaining at least the classical dynamics for free. Also, Bergman's first studies of constrained Hamiltonian dynamics were guided by the goal of obtaining the equations of motion of point singularities in a quantized gravitational field. Just like the tradition of unified field theories, quantum gravity, quantum gravity research fed into the Renaissance. It also preserved much of the expertise and the motivation for exploring GR during its low watermark period. More specifically, it suggested problems relevant for quantum field theory that eventually turned into problems of intrinsic interest within GR. A striking example is the study of particle-like solutions, such as Wheeler's geons, which were supposed to deliver non-singular non -singular description of quantum matter particles, and ended stimulating the study of topologically non-trivial solutions of the Einstein-Maxwell equations. Similarly, the issue of star collapse was originally meant primarily to provide input into the question of nuclear dynamics and meson decay and not as an exploration of the limits of GR. Further examples are Hamiltonian reformulations of GR, which were initially only undertaken to allow for the application of canonical quantization techniques, gravitational waves whose study was also relevant to the quantization program because it allowed an identification of the degrees of freedom to be quantized, and finally the initial value problem, motivated in part also by the study of wormholes, if one considers the paper that Misner wrote, uh, wrote on this. We thus see in the 1950s the hope that the insights into the structure of space-time offered by GR might solve some of the open questions of particle physics. This was, however, not connected to the promise of a more fundamental space-time theory in quantum gravity. And that's interesting because, in this sense, quantum gravity traditions stemming from GR are closely related to the contemporary non-geometric attempts at quantizing a massless spin-2 field in the framework established by Pauli and Fiertz and first used for quantizing gravity in Bryce DeWitt's 1950 thesis. Both, both traditions are mainly concerned with other things than space-time, even where they aim for a final unified theory. As far as their aim is concerned, one might say that the different approaches to quantum gravity pursued in the 1950s and 60s are more closely related to each other than they are to their respective successes, loop quantum gravity and string theory. In summary, physicists in the decades after the genesis of GR stuck to what they saw as Einstein's methods, but not to his theory. The theoretical developments involving GR in the period prior to the Renaissance made use <coughs> of central principle or central alleged principles of Einstein's theory, as well as of his heuristics and methodology, but for an ulterior purpose, the construction of some sort of successor theory, a goal they did not achieve. They did not treat GR itself to be fundamental enough a theory to warrant detailed theoretical study, nor did they believe that it had much empirical potential beyond what was already known. There was one central exception to this latter belief, and that is cosmology, and I will now turn to that. They, these are, of course, some you know, 
some kind of daring generalizations, and I'm sure we will find exceptions to, uh, uh, to, to those. But this is kind of, you know, a programmatic sketch that I'm presenting to you. So th the details, many details have to be filled in. <coughs> so the establishment of the first ties between GR and astronomy was at least uh, until 1929 a tedious exercise, as I have mentioned, involving a small number of bridge builders whose names fit on a single slide, Freundlich, Schwarzschild, De Sitter, Eddington, Lemaitre, and Hubble. From these beginnings, two rather separate research agendas emerged, separate not just from each other, but also from the core of uh, general relativity and from the theoretical developments that I have just outlined. On the one hand, we have investigations of what were to become the three classical tests envisaged by Einstein as early as 1907. On the other hand, we have investigations of cosmological issues whose only observational basis were the redshift observations. Of the classical tests, both the bending of light and the gravitational redshift remained controversial topics until the Renaissance, research being fo focused on the development of better measurement techniques and higher precision. This research agenda involved a small number of astronomers interested in a broader spectrum of research activities not necessarily focused on GR. The cosmological research involved a separate group consisting mostly of mathematicians such as Lemaitre, Robertson, Lanchos, McVitie, and McCree. They were mainly interested in how to apply GR to cosmological problems, which not only involved understanding cosmic dynamics, but also solving the intricate problem of interpreting cosmological solutions to the Einstein equations, in particular separating time, which determined the evolution of the universe, from space, to which simplified assumptions concerning the structure of the universe, such as homogeneity and isotropy, were to be applied. Another problem was the meaning of the cosmological constant used by Eddington and also Lemaitre to solve the contradiction between the age of the universe predicted by GR and the geological age of the Earth. As soon as the framework for a relativistic cosmic dynamics was established, it was separate enough from the full theory of GR to open an arena of cosmological debate in which it could be challenged and modified with consequences merely affecting the cosmological sector. In the early 1930s, starting from purely philosophical considerations about the construction of a theory so separated from experimental evidence, Milne believed that cosmology should be a purely... Do I have Milne here on the picture already? Yeah, okay. Uh, Milne believed that cosmology should be a purely deductive uh, field of research. He constructed a cosmology starting from special relativity <coughs> and the cosmological principle, that is, that there is no privileged point of observation in the universe. Milne's theory engendered a controversy that lasted until the 1940s and as a side effect suggested the formulation of the Robertson-Walker metric. In 1948, similar philosophical considerations led Bondi, Gold and Hoyle to propose another alternative to relativistic cosmology, Christian the steady state theory. It extended the cosmological principle claiming that there is also no privileged time implying a constant matter density. To reconcile this with expansion, it was necessary to postulate the continuous creation of matter. The proponents of the steady state theory ridiculed the notion of a universe originating in an initial singularity as a big bang, which to them seemed a physically unacceptable extrapolation of relativistic cosmology. Big bang cosmology actually had some first successes to show at this point, in particular the explanation of, of the frequency of elements through Gamow's 1946 work on primordial nucleosynthesis. But the need to trust extrapolations of GR all the way back to times far removed from the present and even all the way back to the initial singularity made such early universe cosmology highly doubtful and steady state theory for a long time remained a preferred theory of the universe. Again, it needs to be stressed that the anti-relativistic stance of steady state theory was limited to the cosmological arena and did not constitute a disavowal of the basic space-time notions of GR itself. Remarkably, this separation from the foundations of GR is true on both sides. Gamow's original note on nucleosynthesis does not mention the word relativity at all, but only speaks of, I quote, the general theory of the expanding universe. In summary, the cosmological application of GR was shaped by disciplinary divides and by controversies related 
to mainly philosophical and methodological questions. Outside the application to cosmology, applications of GR beyond the three classical tests were on even shakier grounds. Gravitational waves remained a controversial issue until the Renaissance in the, in the 1950s, when it was tackled with the help of new techniques and concepts such as the Bondi news. The study of collapsing stars had been pursued since the pioneering work of Chandrasekhar on white dwarfs in the early 1930s. The first to significantly use GR in treating a collapsing star were Oppenheimer and Snyder, who generalized Schwarzschild's result to allow for a non-stationary eternal collapse. Not much emphasis was placed on the various singularities occurring in these calculations, and in any case, it was hardly received at the time with exceptions such as Landau. Just like early universe cosmology, it was regarded as an unwarranted extrapolation of GR, which seemed to have a clearly delimited empirical domain. Cosmology and astrophysical applications thus did not significantly change the situation we have observed in discussing the theoretical developments. Certain aspects of the theory were considered to be useful in specific context, but not considered as belonging to an overarching integrated research agenda of relativity. Papers on these matters are to be found in highly diverse publication venues. I don't remember, Roberto, you said it yesterday, how many different publication venues? More than 200. More than 200. So papers were scattered over more than 200 different publication uh, venues. And you know, there were geographical boundaries, there were disciplinary boundaries. So when we talk about the scattering of the field, it was really in all dimensions, the sociological dimension, and of course, the intellectual dimension that I've tried to, to sketch. There were no conferences specifically dedicated to exploring GR in all of its aspects, and there was no coherent community of its practitioners. Within a few years, all of this changed. GR became the uncontested theory of space and time, trusted all the way down to the Planck scale. It became the physical basis of astrophysics and observational <coughs> cosmology. A successful international society on general relativity and gravitation was established with frequent meetings and its own dedicated journal. And the leaders of the field came to be, known among, uh, came to be among the most well-known physicists of the world. So again, here you get a glimpse of some of the statistical data that we have assembled. But the beginnings of the Renaissance are unspectacular enough. A handful of physicists planned a conference to honor the 50th birthday of special relativity at its birthplace in Bern. In his role as president of the conference, president of the conference, a title rarely used these days, president of the conference, Pauli wrote to Jordan, in spring 1955, we want to hold a Congress on Relativity Theory and Cosmology in Bern. Because of the 50th anniversary of Einstein's first work in Bern, there's actually a chance of getting some money for this. <laughs> At the time, after the significant role of physics in World War II and its persistent importance in the global arms race during the Cold War, substantial funding and talent flowed into the field of theoretical physics in general. Also, the global connectivity of the field had increased with international conferences and meetings being held on various specialized subjects, many of which were supported by the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. Nevertheless, as we just heard from Pauli, a recent Nobel laureate sitting in Princeton, had to jump at the opportunity of obtaining funds for a conference on relativity. Given the state of the field, as I have tried to describe it above, this may even hardly come as a surprise. But as we have also seen, there was what one might call a hidden potential, a hidden and dispersed potential embedded in a variety of research traditions touching on general relativity. It was this potential that was now activated under the new conditions of affluence for physics. This activation was, however, as we saw in the case of the Bern Conference, not an automatism, because it was much more likely that any money would flow into fields with a more coherent community and a higher relevance to practical applications than that of general relativity. As our historical research has evidenced, the renaissance of general relativity in the 50s was to no small extent the feat of the emerging community itself. And that's an important statement, I believe, because 
you know, in history, we're always looking for the actors. Who did things and why did people do things? And in this case, I think we have clear indication that it was the community itself that constructed itself. So there was a, you know, conscious reactions to the situation, to the opportunities in the situation, to the challenges and the community constituted itself. I think this is also a great lesson to take, take home from this, from this history. In the middle of the final preparations of the Bern Conference, Einstein's death was announced. Some have claimed that this acted as a liberation, freeing the physics community from the spell of unified field theory. To us, it rather appears that it acted as a wake-up call, reminding a dispersed community that general relativity was now in their hands to be pursued and kept alive. How exactly was the existing potential for the further development now being activated? In 1955, several of the research centers that would shortly become hubs for the new relativity community were already active. In all of the various subfields described earlier that, have kept, that had kept the tradition of GR alive. To name only some of the most influential ones, Syracuse University with Bergman, Princeton with Wheeler, Paris with Linerowitz and Tonnelard, London with Bondi, Warsaw with Infeld. That very same year, a younger generation of theoretical physicists, mainly interested in quantum gravity, were establishing other stable centers of research in the United States, such as the DeWitts at the University of North Carolina. This multitude of smaller local centers was turned from a vice into a virtue the growth in the number of physicists had created a transformation of the curriculum. The tradition of a long and mobile postdoc education was established. Even though it, is still represented, it still represented a rather small community compared to other research fields in physics, its former incoherence provided the GR community with a large variety and a significant geographical spread of temporary homes for the increasing number of younger PhDs that had recently finished their graduate studies. Many of these young researchers worked in three or four of the above mentioned centers, bringing their own knowledge baggage, while at the meantime, in the meantime, keeping in touch with different perspectives and different research agendas. So we see an enrichment of perspective and, and, and uh, liveliness, intellectual liveliness in the field. And there are great, some great examples that you can extract from individual careers and I will just mention one example. Felix Pirani earned a PhD with Alfred Schild at the Carnegie Institute of Technology in Pittsburgh in 1951 and decided to continue his studies in the UK under Hermann Bondi on different problems and earning a second PhD in 1955. He spent a year at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies with Singe in 1954-1955 and he worked at Warsaw University in Infels groups as well as the, at the Institute of Field Physics with the DeWitts and at Ryers with Witten between 1958, Lewis Witten between 1958 and 1959 before obtaining a permanent position. And there are people having you know, even more stations on their way, collecting impressions and delivering new information and so on. This structure made by stable centers and highly mobile and well-trained specialists greatly increased the connectivity of the network of scholars working on GR-related problems at the inter-institutional and international level from the mid-1950s onwards. But merely establishing contact between the various centers was certainly not sufficient, in particular since their leaders were still following widely divergent research agendas. The heterogeneous character of the research in the field of general relativity was evident in the Bern Conference. The various commentators that tried to summarize the results reported at the meeting did not find a common way to categorize the topics that had been touched upon. On the other hand, thanks to the Bern Conference and later follow-up events, scholars were for the first time able to recognize that important progress was being made in GR proper, for instance, in such issues as the Cauchy problem, and that they were important, common questions uh, essential for different research agendas, such as the existence and the properties of gravitational waves. The emerging community was thus able to build a core set of knowledge around which it could formulate a transformed research agenda, increasingly focusing on GR proper. And I find it really interesting that one can bring together this kind of sociological argument with the emergence of an intellectual agenda that is shaping the field. And this really integrates you know, two sides of the history of science that 
often are isolated from each other, just you know, sociological analysis and conceptual analysis. But here you can really see how the two go together. This convergent created a dynamics, a new dynamics of intellectual exchange and innovation in GR. Gravitational waves, for instance, which had been a rather marginal subject, subordinated to other research agendas, now became a central topic within GR proper. New information now traveled much more effectively, not only from one geographical location to the other, but also among subfields of GR. A striking example, we believe, is the Petrov classification, today also known as the petrov pirani penrose classification, which had been developed in the rather marginal place of Kazan, was then taken up by Pirani to treat gravitational waves in order to then become an essential tool used by Kerr in the construction of his solution of the Einstein field equations. It illustrates at the same time why the emerging relativity community was capable of reacting so quickly and so effectively to the challenges connected with the new astrophysical discoveries of the 1960s. They had their newly developed theoretical tools and their experience in explicit community building. Even if GR was not immediately used to give a realistic physical description of the dynamics involved in the newly discovered astrophysical objects, it was immediately accepted that it would be able to do so and that the general physical mechanisms it proposed to describe, for example, the formation of quasars, were correct. In the four decades following Einstein's creation of general relativity, people were inspired and tried to mimic his alleged methodology rather than sticking to the theory of general relativity, which they tried to supersede, as we have seen. The Renaissance turned this around. General relativity now became central and attracted a wealth of new post-Einsteinian tools and methodologies. As a consequence of the breakthroughs happening during the Renaissance, Trust in GR was greatly increased. It now became the basis of an emerging standard model of the evolution of the universe and the theoretical framework for a wealth of astrophysical phenomena. The search for gravitational uh, waves was transformed into that for a new window on the universe rather than just representing a test of general relativity. In our current understanding, the description of space-time by GR has a huge domain of applicability. As we hope to have shown, this was by no means clear from the outset. But the research programs that tried to modify space and time failed, while those that left space and time in peace succeeded. With the huge success of general relativity, it was even hoped that its concepts of space and time might prove to be final. This finality, and this is another twinkle now in the story that we went on, this finality would have manifest or could have manifested itself in two different ways. On the one hand, beginning in the 1950s, some physicists argued for a peaceful coexistence of a classical field theory of gravity alongside a quantum field theory of microscopic interactions. All the attempts at unification and quantization would then have been entirely misguided. But this assumption could be shown to lead to inconsistencies, and a widespread consensus emerged that any field that can couple to a quantum system, as gravitation necessarily does, must itself be quantized. Thus it was clear that, far removed from experimental accessibility, there lurked the unavoidable borderline problem of microscopic gravitational interaction. The other option was that the space-time concept of general relativity might be carried over to the microscopic domain of quantum theory rather straightforwardly through some process of quantization. It was clear that quantization would not leave the space-time picture of general relativity entirely unchanged, but that would then be merely a question of interpreting the implications of a quantum theory of gravity after its establishment. This hope was nourished by the great success of renormalized quantum field theory, which, by the way, had itself undergone various low watermark periods and the establishment of the standard model of particle physics in the early 1970s. But almost immediately it was shown that the same techniques that had led to, a successful, to successful quantum field theories of the nuclear interactions would not be applicable to gravity, as it turned out, as it turned out to be perturbatively non-renormalizable. Only now did gravity emerge 
as the lone classical field theory to resist quantization, and quantum gravity started to appear as what we see today, the central unsolved problem of fundamental theoretical physics. So that was not clear from the outside. It really emerged only as this kind of a new borderline <laughs> problem. It became clear that new foundational assumptions were needed in order to construct a theory of quantum gravity and that fundamentally new ideas concerning the microscopic structure of space-time were necessary. I might say are necessary. The lack of empirical borderline problems at the intersection between quantum theory and gravity was met by a new approach. Two major overarching theoretical structures, string theory and loop quantum gravity arose with fundamental new ideas concerning the structure of space-time. The tension between quantum gravity, between quantum theory and gravity now manifested itself not in empirical borderline problems, but rather in the difficulties encountering, encountered in extracting from these extremely complex overarching structures a mathematically consistent theory of microscopic gravity that is consistent with the low energy theories of general relativity and quantum gravity and quantum theory. These difficulties, one might name the additional dimensions needed for self-consistent string theory, can be viewed as manifestations of the tensions at the borderline of GR and quantum theory. As historians, they might remind us of the consistency issues encountered when trying to bridge the borderline between the classical theories of electromagnetism and mechanics through the overarching ether structure, such as the difficulty of as assigning consistent mechanical properties to the ether. Einstein realized that the problem could be simplified by instead thinking in terms, and I have reviewed that, instead thinking in terms of a structure of space-time itself. It's up to the students present here to find out how we should really think about uh, quantum gravity. It might also not be about space-time at all. Thank you for your attention. Maybe but, I can. But I, I think we should probably take a break at some point and then try to organize them more. And there are other people, I'm sure, who have comments about your things, uh, especially towards the end somewhere. Um, but it was absolutely fantastic, wonderful. I, so, I mean, I know you guys really prepare and, and probably have this is even written down or we can find it somewhere. Yeah, is that it right? is. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Is it on some archive? Not yet, but we waited. You know, if you wanted to pass it through this fire. But maybe we have. <laughs> so, and we need to organize <coughs> chairs and bring some of the people who are still left on our side. Fifteen minutes, or so. In fifteen minutes. Yeah, that would be good. Any urgent would be good to get a drink uh, also. Or 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 Oh, I can give a whole lecture on that. Let me see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <coughs> Let me say with, see whether I have actually. Where's the microphone? I have a microphone here. No, there's another one that I left on the table there. Let me see whether I. I have this. No, I mean, let me, let me just briefly uh, say, I mean, from hindsight, from uh, starting from the Lagrangian of general relativity, it's easy to see what the, uh, what the Entwurf theory is. Because uh, you can write the Lagrangian of general relativity in terms of the Christoffel symbols. And when you now replace the Christoffel symbols by simple derivatives of the metric, you get the Entwurf theory, basically. But that's, of course, not how Einstein found the Entwurf theory. That's how he overcame the Entwurf theory because that was an easy transit from the Entwurf theory to general relativity. He found it by starting from an object, a a basically a divergence of, uh, of the metric, that he thought he could easily, and he could easily relate 
to the way that he expected the Newtonian limit to work, namely from a metric that had only one variable component, because he said he thought that the G44 component of the metric would represent the gravitational potential and that there should no, not be any other off diagonal components of the metric. So that's what he wrote down. Then starting from this object that we have called the core operator, he found that he now needed to impose energy momentum conservation. And he started from an equality known from electrostatics actually. How, you know, when you said, when you write down uh, such a potential, how do you, uh, how do you derive energy momentum conservation uh, from it? And he tried to add terms to this core operator in order to make the theory compatible with energy momentum uh, conservation as he then conceived it, and it turned out to be feasible. But then he didn't. Now this was kind of a hand-constructed object out of derivatives of the metric. Looks very awkward, and I mean, kind of the most elegant way to, let me just finish the sentence then, and uh, to, 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 in, to relate it to the uh, Riemann calculus was the way that I indicated at the beginning. But then Einstein was confronted with the problem of identifying the transformational properties of this object. And he was kind of, you know, tediously by infinitesimal coordinate transformations trying to find out what they were. He did find out that, they, that this was not a generally covariant object. And so the new theory that he had developed with Grossman, the Enwurf theory, was, not, was lacking general covariance. And he had to find a reason for that. And the first reason that he found was that the energy momentum pseudo tensor when you assume that this is a tensor, when you impose the condition as a tensor, you restrict yourself just to linear transformations. And so he thought he had achieved nothing else but, an, but a field theory covariant under general linear transformations. But then he realized after a while that that was a false assumption to the pseudo, uh, uh, that this was a pseudo tensor, not a proper tensor. And then this problem was again an open problem. Then he found the, whole, uh, the famous whole argument, which seemed to show that you could not have a generally covariant theory if you impose uh, a uniqueness uh, uh, of the solutions. And then Einstein looked for relation between the restriction imposed on generally, seemingly imposed on generally covariant theories by the whole argument and the issue of energy momentum uh, con uh, conservation. And he published then in the beginning of 1914 a paper with uh, uh, Grossman, it's called the covariance properties of the uh, and Wolf theory, in which he cast the theory into a Lagrangian formalism and derived energy momentum conservation now from the Lagrangian formalism, but he couldn't do before. And this seemed to give energy momentum conservation as the reason for the restricted covariance, because he found a relation, basically an early bird of what you later see in the Noether theorems, between conservation law and transformational properties. And then, you know, he felt encouraged that there was kind of a consistency to the theory, and he further elaborated it. And then the, the interesting story that I would take an occasion now to tell is that when Hilbert, you know, Einstein went, uh, went, went to Göttingen and lectured on the Enwurf theory because he basically thought that this was, you know, the final result. Then Hilbert took it up with much more elegant mathematics, and he started, you know, to write down his Lagrangian starting from the Ricci scalar. But then, he, you know, believing the physics that Einstein had developed, he also imposed... Uh, uh, energy momentum conservation as an extra condition restricting general covariance. <coughs> general covariance. So there were in those theories preferred coordinate systems in which energy momentum holds, and these were the proper physical coordinate systems. So that's basically the story. Carlo, you wanted to add? Okay. Yeah, he did, absolutely. That was a very, very important uh, part of it. In 1907, you know, I have many slides on this, but I won't waste the time to, to look for this. In 1907, uh, he first discovered that when you try naively to integrate uh, gravitation into a special relativistic framework, that you, uh, that you violate the Galileo principle that all bodies fall with the same acceleration. So, and, and, and this pointed him really to the relation between inertial and gravitational mass. And then he wondered how could he preserve that uh, equality between gravitational and inertial mass in a relativistic framework. And then rather than further elaborating special relativistic uh, theories, he came up with this idea of the, uh, of the equivalence principle that requires you to treat accelerated frames. And now the trick is, of course, to treat those accelerated frames according to special relativity because then you get some of the uh, effects like light bending or redshift, you know, basically mimicking gravitation through uniform acceleration uh, 
treated according to special relativity. And what he then wrote down eventually was what we now today call the Rindler transformation to an accelerated frame of reference. So, you know, before he even had a theory, he had something like the Rindler transformations, and he could gain a lot of insights just by manipulating the Rindler transformations to but an accelerated frame. These transformations are, do they um, involve gravity? Or yeah, the, he, he, you know, that was the idea of, uh, you know, simulating, if you wish, gravity by uh, the effects of inertial forces in a uniformly accelerated framework. That was, you know, how he developed his intuition. I mean, I imagine the situation, you know, you have, it, it, Einstein said it himself, you have just Coulomb's law, and, no, I, and, and you know that, you know, you look for something like Maxwell equations, but you have no Faraday law, no Ampere law, you have no dynamical <laughs> effects of the field. And that was the situation in gravitation. And the idea that gravity is related to inertia gave Einstein some hints on how a dynamical gravitational field should operate. There were other people looking for, you know, a dynamical gravitational field, but they had didn't have the idea that inertia was related to gravitation. <laughs> so Einstein was really a step ahead there because he cons could consider the field not just as the gravitational field, but as the gravito-inertial field. Uh, and so, you know, the inertial effects that were well known gave him some hints on the dynamical effects, you know, like the centrifugal forces or the Coriolis forces. And he tried to relate those in a metric formalism and so on and so forth. So he had a lot of physical intuition. He did have the formalism that was evolving, and he had uh, the physical uh, intuition coming from the equivalence principle. Who is this guy up there? Somebody That's Ernst Mach, of course. Okay, we're going to take a break of about 15 minutes and then come back uh, with chairs and, and a, a bunch of participants. From okay. yeah, I need to drink. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I approached it with apprehension as a physicist and I found it very accessible, I like David. My name is Barack Cole. Cole, like your cancellor, previous cancellor, but without the H. Okay. 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 I've been working in GR for. I, I'm faculty here, and I've been working in GR for close to 20 years. Pleased to meet you, Jürgen. Pleased to meet then, you yeah. first. Yes. And I wanted to make a comment about uh, your talk, at least one, where you stimulated several ideas.